All the prices due to Allah, the sustainer, the protector, the provider. We ask him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send a blessing and salutation beyond our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Entire his household, all his companions, and all who follow the path of righteousness till the last day. Also, we took a moment to send a blessing and salutation beyond all prophets and messengers, and messengers who came to teach uh, people goodness and to remove them from darkness to light. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove us from darkness to light. Welcome, brothers and sisters. In the uh, Zaid bin Muhammad family gathering in the first English lectures, in this uh, beautiful uh, place, in this uh, beautiful weather, with this uh, beautiful Sheikh, Sheikh Wajidi Akkari. Jazakallah khair. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. What is happiness and how we can get happiness and how we can be happy? People, they try to define happiness. The world is scholars and scientifics, they try to measure it from the history. The scholars like Socrates and others, they try to define happiness and they said happiness is the ability to choose, to choose your entertainment without harming yourself and harming others. So what is happiness? In the later, in the 17th century, people, they focused more on happiness and the, and it's the psychology of happiness and they defined as a positive power and other terms and meaning. In the last 30 years, people they started to teach happiness, knowledge in the top universities like Harvard and Cambridge. So what is happiness? All of those questions will be answered during this interesting uh, lectures by Sheikh Wadi Akari. Fadal Sheikh. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly the way he deserves to be praised and we ask Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace and send his salutations and his blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم upon his companions, his wives and all those who follow them on the path of righteousness until the day of recompense the question, the title of the lecture is a question. And whenever you get a title that is a question, you automatically answer yourself. And that is the reason why I chose the title to be a question that each one of us would receive before attending the lecture. So when you first saw the flyer, and the question was, got happiness. Now, of course, you used to got milk, the actual uh, background of this expression is got milk because at some point they were trying to promote that everybody should drink milk and so that was the thing do you have milk if you have milk then everything's okay if you don't have milk then your life was not that great I, I disagree with that but that's another discussion but the question is got happiness do you actually have happiness and what did you answer I wonder what each one of you brothers and sisters answered when that question was posed to oneself a lot of people claim that they have happiness. A lot of people have claimed to have had happiness. But the truth of the matter is, until we know what happiness really is, we will never be able to assess and evaluate ourselves on whether we are truly happy or we aren't. Specifically, when we have come to learn that so many different philosophers and scientists and so many human beings in general are involved in defining happiness. So if you look at a definition of happiness from a purely worldly point of view, a lot of people will raise their hands and say, I'm happy. I'm extremely happy. But if you look at happiness from a religious point of view, from a spiritual point of view, then the hands will become much fewer less people will raise their hands and say, I'm truly happy. If happiness was money, all the rich people will say they were happy. But then why do we hear and see rich Hollywood stars committing suicide, becoming drug addicts, becoming alcoholics, drunkards, and they live a very odd life, 
even though they're in the spotlight, and everybody in some case, children maybe grow up dreaming to be in the spotlight. And those people achieve the spotlight, and then they decide to end their own lives, either directly by killing themselves, which is pretty insane, or by living a lifestyle where that person's basically death is just around the corner. So you wonder, hmm, were they really happy? I mean, they could drive any car they want. They can go anywhere they want. They're known amongst the people in the streets. Yet, they are miserable in so many ways. And people that you know, that were living a life away from the religious life. And then, even though they had what, it, what seemed to be the worldly life in their hands, they were truly unhappy. They are happy moments. So you will not, because you could say, man, you see these people in the club, man, they're having a blast. What do you mean this guy is miserable? He's not miserable. Look at him, he's having fun. Yes, he is having fun for that short period of time. Happiness based on some engagement in some activity, in some substance. But as soon as they further and they go away, then that person's happiness goes right along with it. Who is the truly happy person? He is the person that has understood the true meaning of happiness. And the true meaning of happiness can never be restricted to this life of ours. Our lifespan going from, let's say, maximum 70, 80 years, the average uh, lifespan of a Muslim from this ummah would be 60 to 70 years. If you think that being happy throughout these years is ultimate happiness, then we have already started on the wrong foot. Happiness is much more than that. Happiness must connect this worldly life to the moment we die. Because at the moment of death, then we will identify whether we are really going to be happy or quite unhappy. The scholars, when they look into happiness in this worldly life, because it is important to establish happiness now to attain it later on. And when I say we have to establish happiness, don't think that this means you would have already bought a house and purchased a nice car and you have a good job because that is equal to happiness, suggesting that if you have any of these elements missing, you are doomed for sadness. That is not true. Happiness actually begins with faith that resides in the heart. If you don't believe me, read the biography of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. Who else in the world can be admitted to prison? You go to prison. I don't think, of, I cannot imagine anyone who goes to prison and will have any type of entertainment, any type of content. I mean, prison is a miserable place. May Allah protect all of us from that place. Yet Shaykh al-Islam, when he was put into prison, not because he robbed a bank, it's because he issued a fatwa. He said, what can my enemies do to me? Jannati fi sadri. My paradise, my delight, my entertainment, my happiness is in my chest. It's not, it's not connected to the material. Putting me in a prison by myself is seclusion with Allah. I get to worship Allah without any distraction. If they kill me, then I'm just a martyr. There's absolutely no way they can make this man miserable. And they were not able to make him miserable. This is not to encourage any type of uh, revolutionary ideology where people go against. His issue was with the other scholars that had a different way of understanding Islam other than the way of the companions. But this defines how a person can truly be happy in the ultimate sense. To achieve happiness, there are natural ways, there are practical ways, and there are religious ways. And only a Muslim has the ability to acquire all three. Only a Muslim. Anybody else will be able to play with the first and the second. There are many things you do in your life that will bring about happiness. That have to do with your well-being, with material being available to you and what have you. 
But the most important one, which is the spiritual religious one, that is not attainable except by someone who has accepted Islam as a religion of Allah. And that is a beautiful thing, that this is our common denominator. And it doesn't mean that we use this to look down upon others. We should use this to try to bring others to this blessing that Allah has given us. Through the beautiful speech, through the admonishment, through al mawid al hasana through the way of the Prophet ﷺ in his dealings with the people. This is khair that Allah gave us. Make it available to others. Use modern means to make it available to others. But without that, you will never truly meet a happy person. And even if they may appear to be happy outwardly, they are sad inwardly in so many ways. And even if they fool themselves into thinking they're ultimately happy, once they die, the happiness is gone. So how do we achieve the ultimate happiness that begins in this worldly life and extends to the life to come? I will not refer to my uncle's opinion on the subject matter or my cousins or the neighbor or the guy down the street. When we want to refer to such core matters, then we have reliable, authentic sources. The light, the real light through which you're able to see the path that will lead to paradise. And that is none other than the book of Allah and the example of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we have clear statements from Allah, wherein Allah says, مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٍ فَلَنُحِيَنَّهُ حَيَاةً طَيِّبًا This is one of the most amazing ayat in the Qur'an. Because it tackles so many different realms and subject matters in very precise and concise words. Whosoever does righteous deeds, and that is the evidence or that is the condition. The first thing to attain happiness is righteous deeds. مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى This is to show you that in Islam there isn't this type of sexism or discrimination between the male and the female gender. When it comes to your relationship with Allah and the ability to attain paradise, then this is for everybody, male and female. But then Allah added two words that are of extreme importance and interest. Whilst that person is a believer. Because without belief, good deeds are like pictures or frames that you're hanging on the air. There's no wall. You go to a house, you go to one room that doesn't have a wall, one of the walls is not there, and you try to hang different decoration. And as soon as you put it up there, it will fall in front of you and break. That's good deeds with no iman. Without iman, the foundation upon which you can place your good deeds, a person cannot utilize and benefit from them. They can in this worldly life. Somebody can give charity, help so many needy people. And Allah will give them a reward accordingly in the worldly life. But it is not the currency of the life to come. You cannot use it as a payment to enter paradise. So iman is important. And obviously, as the ayah suggests, this amal salih and iman... And then the promise of Allah, فَلَنُحِيَنَّهُ حَيَاةً طَيِّبًا And then we have so many different letters um, and, and connected in this word to further affirm and emphasize the promise of Allah. It's like tawkid for emphasis. We will surely, inevitably, no doubt, grant him حَيَاةً life, طَيِّبًا A good life. فَلَنُحِيَنَّهُ 100% This حَيَاتُ الطَّيِّبَ however is proportional to the iman that person has وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنْ and عَمِلَ صَالِحًا and the good deeds So they go like this If you want both scales to go up together the more iman with righteous deeds the more the person will be given a good life Again a good life doesn't mean that your bank account grows I don't want this misconception to overwhelm us. When we speak about happiness, it means I have dunya in, within my possession. It is one of the things, but not the only thing. Surely, having worldly facilitation 
is important and among the means of happiness, no doubt. No doubt, having a comfortable car that doesn't break down every other week, and that where the air condition is working, and the heat that will deliver you to work, and you have a job, surely this is among the means that you need. This is something we actually strive for. It is not blameworthy. It is blameworthy, however, to think that this is happiness, period. And then make it conditional to our happiness. If I don't have it, I cannot be happy. Not true. So the level of Iman and the level of good deeds will then further enhance that promise of Allah Azza wa Jal of al hayatu Tayyibah. And what, I mean, if anyone promised you anything, no matter how high profile this person is, they might back out on you. They might disappoint you. But when Allah promises people, then Allah told us that in Allah la yukhliful mi'ad. Allah does not break any promise He makes. So this is a promise from Allah. How can we doubt it? We don't have the choice. We cannot even doubt it. Someone can say, well, I, I don't have this hayat al-tayyibah, but I am a believer and I do good deeds. We say, very good. Now we need to put this iman and good deeds under the microscope. And get a closer look. What is the quality? What is the quality of this Iman and good deeds? We will find no doubt that we have low quality Iman and low quality good deeds. And those two descriptions will result in this Hayatu Tayyibah not being as Allah promised. Because we have a deficiency on our end. And no one is arrogant to deny that. We know. Good deeds, it's a very tricky subject matter. A lot of people do many good deeds, but then little things sometimes come in and destroy them. Showing off. Someone can be doing so well, then at some point, this, this waswas, this, this whisper from the shaitan, to do this for reputation or for whatever, to show off. And that person is stripped away from the whole value of the deed. Because of an idea that occurred and he entertained it or she entertained it. We don't think about that. Some people have gone so far in showing off, they don't even realize that they're showing off anymore. They used to have some sort of, they used to blame themselves. You know, they would have this, nafs al lawama. They had this blaming self that kept talking to himself. You know, I, I shouldn't do this. I should be sincere. At some point, even that goes right out the window. Then the person wonders why. Well, this is because of the quality of the good deed. It's not acceptable to Allah. And more important than the good deed is the iman. The iman. The iman in the six pillars. And so many of us are able to enumerate them. If someone said, what is iman? That's beautiful, mashallah, tabarakallah. Okay, now you said them. Have you really ever delved into each one of those thoroughly? Are you able to lecture, you yourself, are you able to lecture on each one of these pillars independently without having to refer to any material? Do you have to go through some websites that you Google first to learn about who Allah is so you can speak about it? Who the messengers are so you can speak about them? What are the scriptures? The malaika? Many people don't even know anything about the malaika. They just know that they are malaika. And when they think of a malaika, they imagine some baby with wings and a halo. Say, oh, it's malaika. This is not malaika in our deen at least. We don't know what they look like. But we have a lot of description of the malaika and the Quran and the Sunnah. So if you really want to know whether we have the quality in the six pillars of Iman, in this Iman, each one of us should be able to deliver a talk on each one of them without any rehearsal, without any revision, without any sources to refer to. Off the top of your head, you should be able to speak about Allah his rububiyyah, his uluhiyyah, his asma' and sifat. At least the foundations. You don't have to be Shaykh al Sabi Taymiyyah, but at least the foundations. Otherwise, how do we worship Allah? How are we going to understand what we're doing in the salah? How is the salah going to change us? 
It won't. How are we going to understand that the malaika are writing down? If we don't really believe the way we're supposed to believe in the malaika, based on the ayat which describe them, that they're writing down. مَا يَلْفِذُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ You cannot even say a word, except that there's an angel writing it down. كِرَامًا and كَاتِبِينَ well, These are all in the Qur'an. And the list goes on, brothers and sisters. We will find out, okay, you know what? I'm not doing that great in this field. Well, dar, that explains then why the happiness we have is 50-50. Maybe less. This is the first thing. This is in terms of rectifying our relationship with our Creator subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we are all sinful. Don't misunderstand me. We're not talking about one of us becoming an angel in the sense that he does not disobey Allah. The malaika don't have the free will. We have been given the free will. Al-ins wal-jinn have been given the free will. Allah told us what to do and then we choose to obey or we choose to disobey. We choose to believe or we choose to disbelieve. قُلِ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ This is the truth from your Lord. Whoever wills can believe and whoever wills can disbelieve. Allah gave us that choice. It doesn't mean we're going to reach that level. We will still struggle. It has to be with struggle. Struggle is part of this life. However, we are striving and aspiring to achieve to promote ourselves in our relationship with Allah. And when we fall into sin, which we will, we don't let the shaitan trick us into despair. And I think personally, from my interaction with people, this is one of the biggest calamities and a phenomena that has become unprecedented among the Muslims. And that's why we see this atheism spreading like white fire. People abandoning the deen tooth and nail. It's because of this very sensitive subject matter. A person sins and then they continue to sin and there's no true repentance. Then the shaitan continues to tell them, you know what, you're a worthless human being. You're no good for anything. You know what, you might as well just give up on the whole thing. Allah will never forgive you. And then they believe shaitan. They accept his advice. And they slowly but surely start pulling away from the deen. And then there's guilt, a guilt, a feeling of guilt that you're going in the wrong direction. How do you avoid this guilt? Just say there's no religion to begin with. Ya Sheikh, the whole thing is nothing but gimmicks. And then that person now feels at least at ease with themselves. That they can disobey Allah freely and their justification is there is no Allah. There is no God. It's just all about the worldly life. You may not be aware of the rate of people going in that direction, but it's pretty high. It begins with someone truly believing that Allah will not forgive them. Even though Allah explicitly made this haram in the Quran. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Say, oh my slaves who have transgressed against themselves, do not despair from the mercy of Allah. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا Allah forgives all the sins. No matter how, how many they are, as in some of the ahadith, even if they were to reach the, the skies, sometimes saying, Subhanallah wa bihamdih, Subhanallah al azim Allah will erase all of that. Saying, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka, inni kuntu min al zalimin, Allah will erase all of that. And Allah loves to forgive, He loves to, to show tawbah, to accept the repentance. So no matter how bad our situation gets, never let the shaitan make you reach that point of despair. Always remember that Allah is happier when you return to Him than as in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, than the man who had lost his mount and was expecting death. And then all of a sudden, he saw that his mount had returned to him and that he will not die anymore. To the point that he said, Allah, oh Allah, you are my slave and I am your Lord. The Prophet ﷺ said, من شدة الفرح. He made a mistake because of how happy he was. After he was preparing for death, now he was given another chance to live. Allah is happier than that individual when one of us ret returns in repentance to him. I'm saying this because when we speak about Iman, 
it's a very fragile subject matter. And some feel, this guy is speaking about things that I can't even grasp. This is beyond me. I'm not there. I will never get there. This is nonsense. This is from the shaitan. This is achievable and attainable by each believer. No matter how low the iman is, iman is meant to grow. As long as we don't let the shaitan interfere. Further, the Prophet ﷺ gave us some guidelines that are in harmony with this ayah. Wherein he said والسلام, in the authentic hadith, Amazing, wondrous is the affair of the Muslim. عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُسْلِمْ فَإِنَّ أَمْرَهُ كُلَّهُ خَيْرٍ His affair, the believer, the Muslim, all of his affairs good. If something good happens to him, he is thankful to Allah. وَهَذَا خَيْرٌ لَا And this is good for him. And if a calamity befalls him, he is patient. And this is also good for him. And that quality cannot be given to anyone except a Muslim, a believer. That even a calamity becomes a source of goodness. Some people, for example, right now, they want to speak about current affairs and what's happening to the Muslims all over the world. Whether we mention particular countries or we don't is irrelevant. And they freak out and they get emotional. There are many Islamic guidelines about the current affairs that a lot of us are unaware of. Just bear in mind that for the believers, even the calamity which, which breaks our hearts, it, it makes you cry. But that calamity for the believer is good for him. At the end of the day, the oppressor will be held accountable on Yawm Al-Qiyamah and the oppressed will be admitted to paradise. While some of us have to struggle to attain paradise, some of us, paradise is coming right at their door. It doesn't mean that we don't have responsibility. But that responsibility has guidelines. It is not emotional. And the most important thing is to understand this fundamental principle. That even the calamity which befalls us or befalls the Muslims is actually good. At least it is making us realize that our affair will not change until we return to the deen of Allah. You see all these calamities is because of us. It's because of us. And it doesn't require any uh, physical action at this point as much as it requires a true return to the deen of Allah. People want the shortcut. And that shortcut is a short cut. If you want to achieve the, the ultimate success and honor, it is by going back to the roots. And this requires raising a, a society upon the values of Islam. Not just getting emotional when we see some videos and people doing all types of wild, violent acts, and then they wonder how come the victory of Allah hasn't come around. Because it doesn't happen in this chaotic manner. It doesn't happen by people just traveling over there and getting engaged in, in the warfare without any whatsoever. Our religion is the last thing that allows this type of chaos. But people see a video on YouTube, they see some pictures, they get emotional, they want to go help. That's not how you help. These things have to be said and spelled out because there are a lot of misconceptions among the youth especially. It has to begin here, internally. And it has to be built upon a foundation. The return to the deen of Allah, which we all admit is absent. You go to certain families. Islam is only when it comes to time of salah. But any other subject matter, when you refer to the Quran and Sunnah, is thank you very much, not interested. Where's the local, you know, law? Which is in favor of male over female, or female over male, or something that might contradict the teachings of Islam. But at home, we don't even implement it. We don't even refer to it. And what do we expect? How is it going to be established? Through the, the violence which has become widespread. What is the result of the violence? All types of people dying without even knowing why. So the shabab have to be careful in which direction they go and who, who plays with their minds. And distracts them from the more important things. A lot can be established by adhering to this deen. And then Allah Azza wa Jal promised that He will grant us the victory that we were promised. So the Prophet ﷺ gave us this fundamental teaching. 
that when you are a true Muslim, even the calamity is in your favor. At least, at least it means that Allah punished us for our sins now and that we will not be held accountable for that sin on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. That's the, the first step. When a calamity befalls one of us, this is the uquba being hastened for that person. Because Allah could delay it until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And if any, was, any one of us was given a choice between choosing to be punished now and then not being held accountable before Allah or being held accountable before Allah on the last day, we will choose that we want to get rid of it now. Finish it off now. Because this worldly matter, it can be dealt with. You can always get back on your feet. But on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, if we have to be held accountable, there's no second chance. There isn't a second chance. The first ayah has another ayah which completes it, but it is the reverse meaning. So one ayah mentions that if you do good deeds and you're a believer, Allah will give you al hayat al tayyibah Then you have, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ Whosoever turns away from my remembrance, he will surely lead a miserable life. So in the Quran, we have Allah promising two things in this context. A good life for the believer who does good deeds and a miserable life for the one who turns away from his remembrance. And the scholars say a dhikr here involves the whole deen of Islam. It is not referring to someone who doesn't say subhanallah a hundred times or alhamdulillah a hundred times, even though that is in part of it, but it's not referring to that limited uh, linguistic meaning of dhikr. Dhikr here is comprehensive to everything which serves as a reminder about Yawm Al Qiyamah. That's why Allah called it dhikr. This dhikr is the whole thing, the whole deen of Islam in its totality, Quran and the Sunnah. So the more we turn away from them, the more we've been promised a miserable life. And this is something which you can witness with your own eyes and the lives of the people around you. The more they turn away from the teachings of Islam, the more the situation becomes miserable. How does it become miserable? It doesn't mean that suddenly his car disappears. It doesn't mean he doesn't wake up for Fajr. So he gets out of the house, he sees that the car is not outside anymore. And it's like, oh, automatic. Oh, I didn't pray Fajr and Jama'ah. Oops, my car is gone. Then he misses Dhuhr, then he loses his job. He misses Asr, then he divorces his wife. He misses Maghrib, now he's begging for money outside the masjid. He misses Isha, a car runs him over. See, some people think that it has to be like this for the equation to make sense. Absolutely not. The misery is not so shallow that you immediately lose something. The misery could be that you don't know how to deal with certain things that happen in your life. Misery could be that something happens to you and you freak out and panic. You don't have that, that iman which will keep you firm. Which will allow you to say, Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. Alhamdulillah in all affairs and situations. A person missing these important traits is sometimes among the biggest reasons of misery. This is the same thing that leads to people to say, why did this happen to me? Oh Allah, why me? Why me? This is the last question a true believer will ever ask. Subhanallah, how can we say to Allah, why me? Think Allah is going to do, you know, Allah is going to harm a believer for, for, for just for fun? Hasha lillah, Allah raised himself above this. That Allah Azza wa doesn't play with this creation in this, in this manner. Allah doesn't play with this creation. So when these things happen, they're for a reason. And the true believer has skills to deal with it. The miserable person is the one who the smallest calamity for him becomes the biggest source of misery because they don't have the tools to deal with it. So there is justice in the whole subject. The more we turn away from the teachings of the deen, the more misery will come around even after some time. And even if it's delayed until the life to come, then that is miserable enough, wallahi. That a person sees others entering Jannah and he's not among them. The first batch to enter Jannah and, and we cannot be among them. And it's not like you see people entering Jannah and then you're like, okay, well, I guess I didn't make it so I'll just relax on this chair 
for the next few hundred years? No, there is another destination. If we don't make it to Jannah, we're going to hell. Simple. Subhanallah. So reflect. Reflect on this for a while. So it is important then to keep the dhikr in, its, in all of its meanings and, and byproducts integral in our, in our lives. And the more we adhere, the happier we will become. Among the second means to achieve true happiness after acquiring proper belief and doing good deeds is being kind to people. Being kind to people. And this is a trait, subhanAllah, a trait which we, you, know, you can give hours of lectures about. And if we were to cite all of the words of the Prophet wasallam regarding this, then it will be books regarding al-husnul khuluq, the good character. This goes a long way. And a person who doesn't have a good character is doomed in so many ways to be miserable in this life. Because this life is a social life. You don't live alone on the top of the mountain with some sheep. You are living in a society where you are intermixing with people, interacting with people on daily basis. And if we don't have the skills to deal with other human beings, then we will be miserable in so many ways. The happiest people are those who know how to sort out their matters with their fellow human beings. I'm sure many of you can relate to this from your jobs. You see certain individuals at work who don't have the interpersonal skills to deal with others. You find that they hate so many people in the company and they're hated by so many people in the company. And they're always getting into altercations and confrontations with other employees. And you see on the flip side, someone who has learned this fundamental Islamic quality. And he treats people with kindness. And the people are forced to treat him with kindness. Some exceptional cases, some people are mean even if you're nice. But that person who is kind to others and receives kindness, this allows him to enjoy himself even in a work environment. That person is able to smile and put a smile on people's faces. And this is a, a beautiful prophetic tradition of the Prophet wasallam, Smiling, being nice. I mean, you, you go through the people, you go around, you see people rarely smile. The way you deal with others, even when you board an airplane, and you're dealing with the stewardess and the flight attendants and what have you. Some people just, and, and sadly, you know, the appearance is Muslim. He comes in, is upset the whole time, frowning. And he sits down like he's living in his own world. There's absolutely no interaction, no kind, no kind words, no good morning, good afternoon, marhaba, anything. Salaamu alaikum if that person is a, a Muslim. How are things? Hope you're doing well. Thank you so much. They, they don't even think of these words. They think this whole world was made to be their slave. Everything should be brought to them. Like just because that flight attendant is working, you know, on board of a plane, meaning she or, she or he don't deserve any kind words. Like thank you or please. But when you actually use these words, which are only common sense, then at least you will gain some respect and appreciation from your counterpart, the person you're dealing with. And then your whole flight might become much better than you fighting with almost everyone or at least being in your own world with this frowny face the whole time, frowning face. Being kind and being nice, if opening the door for someone, waiting for someone, keeping the elevator open for someone to get on, so many little things, little things that we can do that go a long way. These qualities are, are sometimes missed they're, they're, they're absent in our lives. But they are among the best tools to grant you and grant us a happy life. Try it from tomorrow, from tonight. 
Try to change your attitude. Especially in your work environment where you spend most of your time. Eight hours, seven hours a day you're at work. Depending on your job. Some people go for three hours. I've been looking for that job for many years. I haven't found it yet. It's nice to work for three hours and then go home. Try it. Change your attitude. You know, be extra kind and sweet and courteous to people around you and see the results. When someone backbites, don't get involved. Or advise the person. When someone says something bad about another person, some gossip comes around. You are the one who, with your good character, controls the situation. You find an excuse for that person. It's okay, maybe he was, maybe he was upset. Don't talk about it. Let's go, let's go have a cup of tea. Change the subject. Be a source of, of, of goodness in your environment. And Allah says, هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ is the reward of goodness anything but goodness? Allah will treat you equally. And Allah will facilitate your affairs equally. So being nice to others. And of course it begins with the family. Because these are the people you interact with the most. Your immediate family. Then your extended family. Then your neighbors. And so on and so forth. The more we are kind to others, the more kindness we will receive. As a general principle, exceptions do exist. Some people will be mean to you no matter how kind you are. Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. This is our ibtila in the dunya. Thirdly, seeking knowledge. Someone could say, what in the world does learning Islam have to do with me being happy? Well, there is a very close relationship between the two. Because Allah told us, يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتِ Allah will raise those who believe among you and those who, uh, those who have been given knowledge in different degrees and levels. So the more you learn Islam, the better you're able to practice it. And the better you practice Islam, the more your affairs will be facilitated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So learning this religion is actually among the means of attaining happiness. Because not learning it is among the means to attain misery. I'll give you a very quick example. Something that has to do with the fiqh, the jurisprudence of uh, Salatul Musafir. The prayer of the traveler. If you don't know all of the areas that are related to this, beginning from wudu, and whether you can wipe over your socks or not. And the duration in which you can do this. And what is allowed in the salah of the musaf and what isn't. And whether you can combine the prayers or not. And what is the distance. A lot of this stuff, if you don't have it covered, a travel becomes very miserable. And very tiring and agonizing. Because the person is not able to pray adequately. Because they don't know. So a person who's wearing shoes and socks. And you go into some other country, you're traveling from one city to another, whatever the situation may be. In Islam, the wise thing to do, which is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, is that you put on these socks upon tahara. And you wipe over these socks as you travel. Versus going to certain airports where there, it's not meant there's no musalla. You go to the bathroom, you have to take off your shoe. And then take off your sock, and then you put your foot in the sink, and then some people walk into the bathroom. It's like, what the heck is this guy doing here? You showering in the sink? Just, just bear in mind, for us Muslims, if you see another Muslim's foot in the sink, this is absolutely normal, right? It's like, okay, he's making wudu. But you have to look at things from the perspective of the non-Muslims. Why is someone washing his feet where I'm, I put my face? This is a complication of the deen when Allah gave us that rukhsa, that concession to wipe over your socks and facilitate your life and the life of others. A person makes their life difficult by insisting on washing their feet. It is against the sunnah to wash your feet in this context. Because the Prophet ﷺ was wearing the leather socks and the sahabi wanted to take them off. He said, Da'huma. He said, leave them, don't take them off. I put them in the state of tahara. And he wiped over them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
And the same applies to prayer uh, on the plane. You can't pray jama'ah. Someone said salatul jama'ah is for you. If you're not, if you're not gonna able to get three, four people to pray jama'ah in an airplane, when the area for you to pray can barely fit one human being. خلاص تسقط الجماعة no no more جماعة on the plane if it's not feasible and you pray two rak'at for dhuhr two rak'at for asr two rak'at for isha because you're a traveler and you combine them together because when you arrive at your destination you're going to be running around checking into the hotel what have you these are things that Islam made very easy people that don't have knowledge they get complicated they're miserable they're not happy because they're trying to fulfill the deen of Allah but they've made the deen difficult for themselves. The one with knowledge has the basira and the nur of the knowledge to be able to deal with these matters very swiftly. Just like the Prophet ﷺ did. Fourthly, we have to focus on the present and forget about the past. The Prophet ﷺ said, احرص على ما ينفعك ولا تعجز. Focus on that which is beneficial for you and don't despair. And if something happens to you, do not say, لو أني فعلت كذا كان كذا وكذا Had I done such, then such and such would have happened. ولكن قل قدر الله وما شاء فعل Or قدر الله وما شاء فعل However, you should say, Allah decreed and Allah did whatever He willed. فإن لو تفتح عمل الشيطان Because that term, لو if, will open up the door of the shaitan. This is another fundamental rule in achieving true happiness. Focusing on the things which are beneficial for you because focusing on things that are not beneficial is obviously not beneficial. And it will keep you distracted the whole time. You can't, you can't gather your thoughts, you can't focus. And then further, the idea of dealing with the qadr. When something happens to you, it's done deal, it's in the past, don't dwell on it for too long. Okay, we're human beings, we're going to feel some sadness. It's normal. But don't let that go too far. Because if you start saying, yeah, if I had done this, then this would have happened. If you, you, it's never ending. What is the result? Let's say you give all the, all the possible conditional phrases, all the ifs. If, 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 ten times. Are you able to go back and change any of them? No. It's done. So why waste your time with if? Khalas, done, move on. Focus now on the thing which you have control over, the present and the future in some way. As in what you, from the asbab which you follow, the means you follow to do something for the future. Otherwise, you can't, we can't control the future either. In fact, we can even control the present. But the one thing we definitely cannot even touch anymore is the past. So what's in the past? should be left in the past. And this is why we learned this beautiful dua from the Prophet ﷺ. I would want to be mean and annoying and say whoever knows this dua, raise your hand. But then that would put a lot of us on the spot. And that's not nice of me to do. So as me applying my own advice of being kind to others, I will not do this. But I hope and pray that you know this dua. It's a very small, very simple, and very straightforward dua where the Prophet ﷺ combined all the goodness you could think of which is the dua Allahumma aslih li deeni alladhi huwa ismatu amri Oh Allah rectify for me my religion because it's that stronghold of my life it's the stronghold of my life this religion of mine is the most important thing we want Allah to rectify because that's the foundation of everything else wa aslih li dunyaya lati fiha ma'ashi and rectify my worthy affair in which I'm living. You want your affair to be facilitated. You want the nice house. You want the nice car. You want the good children that are educated. No one is saying this is wrong. In fact, this is a need to achieve happiness as long as we don't become distracted with them and forget the first one, which is dini. A lot of people just jump to the second one. You cannot jump to the second one without doing the first. Once you have the first and the second is marhaba. You want it, you want it to be there. Otherwise, we will have some suffering. And then, And rectify my life to come. Because that is my promise. That is my ultimate destination. And make this worthy life 
means for me to increase in every type of goodness. And means to avoid and be, have a peaceful mind and not to worry about every type of evil. Subhanallah. This is one of the most beautiful adri of the Prophet وسلم, which he used to make. Some of us might not have done it once in our life. Not even once. But it's only like a line and a half. A couple of sentences which we can memorize in Arabic. You cannot mem memorize in Arabic, no problem, senor. Memorize them in English, in Urdu, in, in Tagalog, in Chinese, in anything you want. Just memorize them. Make this dua. Because the dua which we invent is good, but it could never be as good as the words of the Prophet Because his, he was, he was given this jawami al kalim. His words were concise and precise, comprehensive, few words with many meanings. And ultimately, they are wahi from Allah Azza wa Jal. So you're basically making dua to Allah with the words that He selected for His creation. For the best of His creation, the Prophet ﷺ. And I encourage all of us to memorize it in Arabic. It will take a couple of days. It's okay. We are willing to memorize a couple of sentences of some other language to get you know, an extra dirham per hour at your job. You would do it. But for this, we can't do it. That's just lazy. Or the shaitan telling us that we can't do things, which obviously we could. Further, the fifth mean is dhikr. الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Allah spoke about those who believe and their hearts find comfort in the dhikr of Allah. Ala bi dhikr Allahi tatma'inu al-qulub. Then Allah asked the rhetorical question, which doesn't need to be answered. The answer is there in the question. Is it not that through the remembrance of Allah, their hearts find tranquility? The remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jal, be it in being mindful of Allah, as in Allah is observing, who was Sami'u al-Basir, and being mindful of Allah, as in remembering Allah, or being mindful of Allah, as in referring to the deen of Allah, reading the book of Allah, all of these are types of dhikr. And the people that are constantly engaged in dhikr are the people that have one of the most important tools of happiness. Sixthly, remember that it could have been worse. Anything that happens to you, know that it could have been worse. If you realize that, then you'll be able to deal with the calamity somewhat easier. Of course, a lot of jokes can be inserted here, but it's not really the time to be joking a lot. But I mean, just to give you a basic idea, if you, uh, you're driving your car, you have a flat tire, it could have been that the tire, think about the worst situation, the tire exploding completely. So as opposed to fixing it for, you know, uh, 50 dirhams, you would have had to buy a new 700, real dir uh, 700 dirham uh, tire. Sorry, I'm used to reals. <laughs> Anything that happens to you, of course, you can be mean and say, if, if you lose one hand, it could have been two hands. Someone says, hey, hey, it's not even, don't even go there. I don't want to lose even one hand. But anything in this dunya you look at, realize that it could have been worse. When you think in this way, then you cope better with the current situation. And lastly, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which, which basically communicates the message of positivity, is the hadith of Look at those who are beneath you. Not in height, because then a lot of people could be taller than you or shorter than you. Beneath you in their status, in their affair. And don't look at those who are above you. Because it is more likely that you will not belittle the favor of Allah upon you. I Meaning if you're always looking at what people have that is more than you, you will become unappreciative to Allah. No, look at those who have less than you, you will become a lot more appreciative to Allah. So the ultimate way to receive or have appreciation, which is a tool of happiness, is realizing that we have been giving a lot and a lot have not been given much. And so this is a ni'mah from Allah Azza wa Jalla. It doesn't mean we become arrogant because of it. No, but this is means to show shukr to Allah. And Allah promised, لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ If you show thankfulness, Allah will definitely increase you. So it's a win-win situation. 
And this has to do with everything in life. Use this as, a, as your motto in life, as your direction in life. Be positive about things. Look, look at those who, who don't have what you have. You will feel good about yourself. So in summary, for one of us to be ultimately happy, he has to apply practical means such as beautifying oneself, smelling good, looking good. A lot of people don't consider these among the means of happiness. This is among the means of happiness. You looking representable as a Muslim figure is among the means of happiness. You smelling good is for your own good and for the people around you. Trust me, everybody will be happy. We overlook these things, but they all play a role in happiness. And then religious means, which I explained earlier. All of those, once acquired, then they create the tunnel or the path through which we can attain the ultimate happiness in the life to come. And the happiness in Jannah, that requires a lecture of its own. What is in Jannah in terms of happiness cannot be said in a few words. However, ask Allah Azza wa Jal to enable all of us to act upon these reminders, integrate them into our lives, and to grant each and every Muslim in this world the ultimate happiness in this life and in life to come, and to guide all the non-Muslims to the beauty of Islam so they can share the, the good which Allah Azza wa Jal had given us. هذا والله أعلم وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد. جزاكم الله خيرا. جزاك الله خير شيخ عكاري for the lecture. To, so to summarize the, the, the secret of, of happiness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said in the whole Quran, مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٍ فَلَنْحِيَنَّهُ حَيَاةً طَيِّبًا Who act righteously men or women, and he believes, then we'll give him good life. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh. Do you like to receive questions? A couple of questions. Uh, yeah, we can receive questions, but only uh, related to the topic. If, if, if you guys don't mind. We have a mic. Is there any questions from the uh, brother sides or the sister sides? Anyone who want to ask question related to the subject of happiness? We have one brother there. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum Sheikh, where can we find the duas like one of the dua you were mentioning? Is there a specific book like is it in Riyadh Salihin or some good book where you can find it? Yes, Jazakallah Khairan. That is a good question. I thought you were going to ask where can we find happiness? I was going to tell you down the street in the supermarket. Uh, where you can find this dua in a very tiny, I would say the most popular book maybe in, in the Islamic world to some degree, Husn al Muslim, the Muslim fortress. Um, it's a very small book, and I think it's also among the most widely translated books. It's tiny, it fits in your pocket. Um, and there's an English version of it, there's an Urdu version of it, and it has all of the adhkar of the sabah and masa, all of the various adhiyah regarding uh, the, you know, the rain, when it rains, seeing the crescent. All the things from the Prophet ﷺ, including that dua, are all found in a small book called The Muslim Fortress. And I think it's only two dirhams. Is there any other question? Yes, sir, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is Muddassir. Hayakallah, akhi. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah, good. Okay, about the happiness, I wanted to understand in Islam how and at what degree does happiness count? How, <clears throat> how and at what degree? That is a, a complicated question, I would say, because I believe personally it varies from an individual to an individual. There isn't like one standardized uh, time and method. Uh, how it comes when, when you know the purpose in life. I would say when a person truly, and of course we, I'm assuming you're referring to the true happiness. 
Because someone can be happy when they watch a movie, for example, and they think, well, here's happiness just came right now as soon as the movie started, or they watch a football game, or what have you. Sure, that is one area of happiness, but I'm assuming you mean the ultimate happiness. That only comes when you know your purpose in life and you feel that you're going in the right direction. Once you know why Allah created you, not just know like knowledge, no, no. You've internalized the idea. Not, not merely thinking about it, living it, implementing it, making it part of your life. That, at that moment, someone can start feeling the true happiness. And then the degree of that happiness will vary from a person to another. That's why, the, depending on their iman. That's why someone like Shaykh al-Islam was completely happy even though he was in prison. Something that none of us probably can say today. So it is related to how much Iman we have. The more Iman we have, you see, you meet sometimes like very poor people and, and you think that they're miskeen, but wallah, he's, the happy, he's among the happiest people in his town. He's just happy, he's content, he has rida. He has satisfaction with what Allah had decreed for him. He's not looking for more. So it varies. And some people, no matter how much they collect, they're still unsatisfied. They want more, they're greedy. So it depends on that person's understanding of the deen, understanding of who Allah is, understanding of the concept of rizq being distributed, and this is my rizq, so I'm satisfied with it. I think all of these play a role in a person reaching it and knowing at what level it will come. Wallahu a'lam. Jazakallah khair. Uh, is there any question from the sister side? Because I cannot see yeah. the, the hands. Yeah. Is there any question? khair, brother. Wa iyaakum. Uh, I just wanted to ask how much burial walidain has to do with happiness? That's a very good question. Yeah, see, uh, that, that should have been included in the, in the lecture, but the, the tricky part about burial walidain is someone might be in a situation where his, his family or his parents are not around, and so I felt it would be depriving them of a tool, and they will think they cannot be happy without that. But, you know, uh, burial walidain obviously... That in and of itself, your parents being happy with you because you're fulfilling their needs and their rights in Islam is the ultimate tool in this worldly life. When available, when available. Uh, sometimes a person's parents are vicious. And no matter how hard you try to be dutiful to them, they don't appreciate it. And that becomes a source of misery for that person. So really it has to be that they're alive and that Allah decreed that they are appreciative of the effort that the children are making towards their dutifulness. And so when all of these are present, then yes, you know, you, you, basically you have, in terms of the most important people in your life after the Prophet ﷺ, it is your parents. It is your parents. So knowing that you are on good terms with them will definitely be a source of happiness. It could work differently for people depending on the situation, but it is very important for those who have the right elements and those elements are in their right situation. It's a little tough though. Zakila khair. Good question. Uh, we will take the last question if there is a question yes. from the sister side. Jazakallah uh, khair, brother. Uh, alhamdulillah, you have answered many questions that uh, were in our minds. Alhamdulillah. And, uh, alhamdulillah for that. Um, uh, you know, may Allah give you all jaza for that, inshallah. Amen. I just wanted to ask you, you started your lecture with an ayah. Could you please give the reference for that? And could you repeat the dua for all of us? Uh, <laughs> yes. Again, the dua I, that you did. Naam. I, I believe the ayah was in Surah Al-Nahl. Do we have any half of here? I believe it's in Surah Al-Nahl. I can... Uh, I'm going to refer to my note cards and pull it out for you, inshallah. Surah Al-Nahl, ayah 97. That was quick, mashallah. Quicker than usual. Uh, the, the dua is Allahumma aslih li deeni ladhi huwa asmatu amri wa aslih li dunyaya lati fiha ma'ashi wa aslih li akhirati lati ilayha ma'adi waj'al il hayata ziyadatan li fi kulli khair wal mawta rahatan li min kulli shar or kama kala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam again even if I repeated it you probably won't be able to memorize it now the Muslim fortress book I, I referred to earlier there are versions of it that have the transliteration Transliteration is when the Arabic sound is written in English letters. So you will find, it will say, Allahumma, it will say A, double L, A, H, U. It will have that. It will have the Arabic text, the way to pronounce it, and the English text. So once you have that book, inshallah, 
you'll be able to memorize it within a couple of hours. And then you can you know, make this dua as often as possible, inshallah. And I just wanted to add one more thing. Um, whenever you make dua for someone, it's it become a habit. I gave a khutbah about this. Do not say inshallah. When you make dua, do not say inshallah. The Prophet ﷺ taught us, one of you should not say Allahumma ghfir li in shi'it. Don't say oh Allah forgive me if you will. So adding mashi'ah, this inshallah to dua is actually against the sunnah. When you make dua, be firm. May Allah make it easy for you and facilitate your affairs. Ameen. Okay, but inshallah is not as if you're saying, if Allah wills, may, he may do this. If Allah wills, he may not do that. No, the, the sunnah in making dua is being, being affirmative in it. Begging Allah profusely, being, being humble to Allah. So uh, you can refer to the khutbah, uh, you can find it on, on, on YouTube, about the etiquettes of saying inshallah, when to say it and when not to say it. And one of the times not to say it is whenever you make dua. So I just wanted to add that. Jazakum Allah khair. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh wa baraka feek. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you all the real happiness in this life and the eternal happiness. Ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower his blessing uh, to, the, to this country and to the mm -hmm. rulers of mm -hmm. this country and all the uh, countries of, of Muslim. Amen. At the end of this beautiful lecture, I would like to call Mr. Halal Al-Fili, the head of the stand uh, team and the protocol to give the award for the Sheikh.